Good noon or afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Can I be heard? Am I live now? I hear you. You are, you are live, Marianne. Thank you very much. The panel begins. Welcome to the final, the concluding panel of this remarkable three days of conference for the Fulbright Association, where we have heard remarkable narratives from so many young researcher scholars about the individual work they are doing in all over the world. We're grateful for all of you and hope that many of you are here for this session, which will begin with, uh, in just a couple of minutes, with people from IIE talking about how we can all be helpful in the student and scholar recruitment for the future of the program. But first of all, let me give a couple of introductory comments. First of all, I'm Mary Ellen Schmieder. Um, I'm a member of the board of directors after having served for a year as president of the board. I teach at the University of Maryland University College uh, in US history and women's studies. Uh, this, this morning or this afternoon, we are going to open the framework from the individual stories that we have been hearing the individual research to be talking about the larger world of recruitment for the Fulbright program going forward with one panel and then how America benefits when there's equality of opportunity and access, the second panel. The process will go this way. We're going to start with the panel from IIE followed immediately by the second panel. Each presenter has about 10 minutes. If you have questions for any of us, please use the Q&A and we hope to have a good 20, 25 minutes at the end of this session for whatever burning questions you have about either one of the panels. Let me then introduce the five presenters. First will be Peter Vanderwater from IIE. He is the head of research and uh, recruitment for IIE, which is of course the granting manager for the Fulbright program. Then there will be Dan Kramer, who is actually a Fulbright alum, as I understand it, and he is director of outreach for the student program. They will be followed immediately by the second panel, which begins with John Vogel, um, followed by Suda Haley, and finally Bruce Fowler, uh, talking about the question of access and opportunity in the United States, which brings us back to the question as a country of law and order at a really critical moment in our culture close to the election with many, many issues going on, how we look at the world we inhabit. So without further ado, I would like to turn this over to Peter Vanderwater of IIE. Great, thank you very much, Mary Ellen. I'm just gonna get the presentation up here. All right, thank you. Um, so everyone can see that in the, the window there? Perfect. Well, thank you for the introduction. Um, this is who we are, Dan and Dan and Peter. Um, we work for IIE, as Mary Ellen mentioned, on uh, various aspects of the, the Fulbright program. Um, and we've um, fortunate enough to have been given the opportunity to come here and talk with all of you uh, a little bit about the, the recruitment effort and the way that um, Sorry, just looking at the chat, I thought somebody was talking about my, maybe my audio wasn't down, but um, um, talk to you a, bit, a little bit about how alumni can be engaged and involved in, in, in outreach and recruitment. Um, so we'll jump right into things. I know that this is, you're nearing the end of the conference and I hope it's all been a very productive and, and enjoyable and um, informative conference. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, the impact of alumni. So to start um, off with a little bit of context, uh, obviously, We've all been living through um, some really chaotic and crazy times. Um, there's a lot of anxiety about the present um, and a lot of uncertainty about the future related to the pandemic and everything that's happening. Um, but one bright spot that we've seen, uh, we just completely, we just recently closed the application, uh, the competitions for the student and the scholar programs. And we saw some really remarkable results. Um, this US student program application numbers up, we're up, we're up by almost 12%. In the US scholar application numbers, we were we, we over a 20 year high in terms of application numbers. 
Um, and, and this is important because it tells us that in spite of everything, in spite of the uncertainty, um, Fulbright is still vibrant. It's still seen as a important way for Americans to engage with the world. And that, um, and that in spite of all of the uncertainty about jobs and in universities and everything else that are happening, people are still looking forward to the future and looking and, and Fulbright is a part of that. Um, and that's, that's been really important to us as we sort of look ahead and try to look for a light at the end of the tunnel in terms of everything that's happened um, uh, the, over the past year uh, for, for that's affected all of us. Um, and one thing that, and, and why that is important is, and when we do surveys, every time we do application, uh, every time we, we open up competitions, we do surveys of applicants. And by and large, the most important tool for recruitment are alumni. Um, people apply because they're encouraged by their peers, by their friends, by their colleagues, by their um, advisors, by their faculty and administrators, people who've had Fulbright grant experiences and say, you should too. And we see that year after year after year, we put a lot of time and effort into messaging and social media and, and a range of different outreach and recruitment um, initiatives and activities. But still, Fulbright alumni always rise to the top as, as the sort of number one reason why people apply to the program. Um, so that's really important that we're speaking to this group. And it's also a big responsibility that you all have uh, to sort of keep the program moving forward by what you do as an alumni, as, as an alum of the program. Um, what we're going to do is talk a little bit about ways that you can be more effective, um, more engaged uh, in, in the role that you play in, in encouraging others to think about the Fulbright experience. Uh, and we're going to lay out a few, a few sort of topics and themes that um, have come up and we've discussed with team members and others about ways that alumni can be uh, play a really important role in this. And the first is stay informed. Um, everyone, all Fulbrighters view the program through the lens of their own personal experience. And that's important. That's really powerful. What you did on your Fulbright grant um, has meaning to you. Um, and, and it's important that when you talk to others that that's, that comes through. Um, but it's also important to know that your experience may be very, very different from somebody else's. What you did on your grant to India 25 years ago, um, the activity that you did, how you went about it, the research that you did, how you engaged with your, your host institution, all of these things may be very different for somebody going to India now or somebody going to a different country or somebody applying for one of the newer model of programs that we have. And just recognizing that when you're talking about your Fulbright experience, that it's informed by kind of the current state of the program. Um, the program is constantly evolving. We're always looking for um, kind of new models, new ways to engage, new ways uh, to use technology and to um, continue to move the program forward. And so it's, it's important that you stay informed about the current state of the program, how it looks for a student, for a scholar, for a teacher, for a researcher, um, and, and what that looks like. Because it, if, if people come to you for information, um, you need to be able to have at least some sense of kind of what the program looks like. Um, and stay connected um, through the active program through our website, social media, and newsletter. So the, we, I'll share some resources at the end of ways that you can kind of touch base and see what's happening within the program, following on social media to see highlights of alumni and other things that, that are happening with the program and different um, commissions and posts around the world, and newsletters. And we've talked with the Fulbright Association about more regularly contributing content to the newsletters that come out from Shaz and John and others that sort of keep you up to date on what's happening within the Fulbright Alumni Network to include content on the state of the current program, deadlines, important new programs, new initiatives, things that are happening um, in the world of Fulbright that uh, you might you want to stay on top of. And those, that's something that will be coming. And there's one more thing I want to mention in this category is something that we will be rolling out in the next month or two uh, is a um, within the Fulbright program websites, we'll be having more of an alumni engagement um, page that will provide um, some of the things we'll talk about here in greater depth. It will provide you know, flyers, maybe simplified presentations, other things that might be useful, resources, ways that you can connect, ways that you can engage um, to, to provide it for, from an alumni perspective. A lot of what we do is for prospective applicants. Uh, and so we're trying to look at ways that we can better inform and engage alumni um, on all, all aspects of the program. Um, the second part I want to talk about is visibility. Um, it's, 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 it's really simple, but don't hide your Fulbright experience. Um, over and over and over, we've gone to campuses, we've gone to you know, conferences, and we've been in situations such as a campus that decided that they were going to hold a big Fulbright event and 
they were trying to build some sense of Fulbright culture on their campus. And they knew there were Fulbrighters on campus, but they didn't have a very strong network. Um, and they decided they were gonna hold a huge reception at the president's um, residence. Um, and what they did is they went in and they to HR and they mined everybody's resumes that worked on that campus for Fulbright to find out who among their staff and their faculty and everyone else on their campus um, had Fulbright grants. And then they invited them to the reception. And this reception was this amazing experience with lots of people who knew each other, but didn't know they were Fulbrighters. Um, oh, you were a Fulbrighter, John? I didn't realize that. And that amazing experience sort of comes, is something that we see a lot when we go to campuses and we present and we bring alumni together where they may know each other, they may be peers or colleagues, but not have realized that they were Fulbrighters. And so what we're asking is to really take a look at everything that you um, you know, your, your uh, personal and professional identity and make sure that Fulbright is featured prominently in there, whether it's your resume or, resume or CV, whether it's a professional bio that you use for conferences or on your, at your place of work, um, whether it's your LinkedIn profile or other social media, um, with, if you're publishing or presenting at conferences um, and that any of that research or thing that you're publishing relates at all to what you did on your Fulbright, we just ask you to please sort of reference that somewhere in there so that you are visible to your peers as a Fulbrighter and people see, um, see you and as, as a model for what they could do. Um, also engage on, in social media. This is something that we always talk about. It's, it's really, really important that we are looking at, um, you know, we, we're, we have a very active social media presence. And if you're on social media, please follow us and, you know, like and share and also share your own experiences using hashtag Fulbright so others uh, can experience that as well. Um, Fulbright Affinity Groups, this is something that has developed over time by Fulbright alumni. It's not an official component of the program, but Fulbright alumni who have determined, and I, I think you've had some people speaking here earlier, um, earlier in this conference on this topic as well, but groups who wanted, who felt like they wanted to make sure that um, their identity was more visible within the context of the Fulbright um, to make sure that experiences of um, Latinx, African Americans, um, uh, Fulbrighters with disabilities and other groups who were part of the Fulbright program were more visible to peers and potential applicants. So they've developed a, a range of different social media entities, uh, Fulbright Noir, Fulbright Latinx, Fulbright Prism, Fulbright Lotus, um, a, a full range of different affinity groups to really showcase that experience um, for uh, people from who identify with that group. Um, so those are ways that you can also join and be a part of and sort of share your experience as well to increase the visibility of your Fulbright experience. And the last piece is something that's sort of coming together. I'm sure you're all aware that Fulbright has a big anniversary coming up next year um, and the Fulbright 75th anniversary. And we're, we're, the, the whole Fulbright community is coming together to do a lot to celebrate this. One thing that we're going to be rolling out is really capturing and sharing Fulbright impact stories. Stories from individual grantees, under individual Fulbrighters about your experience, why it was important to you, what, what, it, you know, what it led to in your future career life. Um, and so just be on the lookout for more sort of calls for um, stories and, and features related to your experience as well. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Dan Kramer, who will uh, take us through the, the rest of the presentation. Great, thanks so much, Peter. And I just wanted to also just uh, highlight the fact that just as the Fulbright Association, you can be a Fulbrighter or a friend of Fulbright, um, in the same way with the affinity groups, um, you may identify differently, but you wanna be an ally of that group. Um, they're also open to having people join in that regard. And this whole idea of allyship is really important for the Fulbright program as we move forward. So I just want to make sure that we're all clear about that. And, and that actually gets me to the next point here about becoming an active you know, member of the Fulbright Association. Um, uh, as, as Mary Ellen mentioned, I, I, I did do a Fulbright a number of years ago. And when I came back to the Boston area, uh, that was the first thing I did was join uh, the association there because I wanted to be in a position to sort of give back. And I think we all feel that way. Um, we were we were welcomed. We were hosted, um, um, maybe, you know, uh, treated um, as as uh, as as almost, uh, you know, cultural ambassadors. And we wanted to do the same, especially for those visiting scholars and the foreign students as they came back um, and as well as to, to connect with them. Um, with alums who had also experienced something else. And I, I encourage you to do the same thing. I did that as a, as a graduate student. Um, and then when I became a faculty member um, down here in, in Central Virginia, we actually, it was part of a, of, of a group that formed the, the chapter down here. And it was an incredible uh, professional experience. So if you're looking for that, we, we learned you know, about rewriting bylaws. Uh, we looked at, at how to do elections. 
Um, these are really important things for you to be thinking about. And, and I, I really emphasize this because I've, since then I've joined a number of boards and been involved in, in those processes. And I think we underestimate about how uh, being an active member um, in this association can lead to developing skills that will take you in other directions and allow you to explore other interests that you have, both personal and professional. And so becoming that active member uh, of the association is critical um, as you move forward and finding ways for you to utilize your talents. Um, I am not the one with numbers, um, you know, so, and I'm not the one with the social media, but I did understand, um, you know, the bylaw process a little bit better. And that was really helpful to be, to, 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 to share that and be a part of that. So I just want to say, we all have our talents and our gifts and we can find different ways to utilize them um, at the national level, at the local level. Um, and I really wanna make sure that you're thinking about that um, as you move forward. Speaking of sort of the social media side, we have developed a, a real online community with the Fulbrighter app, et cetera. And so there's lots of different ways that you can join. And I think that today with COVID and the fact that we aren't able to travel, we aren't able to do things as much in person, the online presence of Fulbright is more important than ever. Um, and so I want to encourage you, even if you're hesitant like I am, to, to be more out there in terms of the social media or the online community. Um, this, is the, this is the time to step forward. Um, you know, overcome that, that hesitancy, join the online community uh, and, and become more, and more engaged. And, and one of those things you know, that we look about in, in terms of the third point is thinking about how you can capture some of the things that you may have done on your Fulbright experience or in other ways to organize particular events um, that might be connected and specific to the locality to which you're coming back to or have recently moved to. Um, I came down uh, coming from uh, rural Minnesota to sort of rural Virginia, and there is a difference. Um, and there's different ways to celebrate that and take advantage of a different climate, a different culture and a different history. And so utilize that as you start to think about organizing and participating um, in events. Um, there is, you know, sometimes uh, the local chapters have funding available or maybe you can do your own fundraising for that. But there are lots of different ways that, that you can become engaged. And I, and I just wanna say, think what works best for you. Play to your strengths uh, with regards to that. Peter also mentioned um, the importance in terms of the recruitment um, and uh, this whole idea of, you know, it's still a, a people to people program and it's, a, it's about word of mouth. And so you need to be connected also then with those who are in constant contact uh, with the students on campuses. And so it's really helpful for you to be aware of who the campus representatives are and this may be, if you're not at a campus, maybe it's at your alma maters, because some of you have been to a number of different institutions. I would encourage you to go to the, to the website and find out who the scholar liaisons are, who are the Fulbright program as advisors are on the various campuses. I know your alumni associations at your schools are constantly getting you in contact and want you to nominate people to go to those schools we want you to, to use the same strategy and thinking about nominating people to be part of the Fulbright program as well. And the best way to do that is get them in touch with the representatives on the various campuses. I also wanna make sure that, that you're thinking about this in terms of for those of you who have the academic background or the professional background, and this is the great thing about Fulbright, Fulbright is well beyond um, the academic sphere. So if you can be involved also as a reviewer, and this may be a reviewer in terms of uh, you know, history as Mary Ellen was mentioning, it may be in the languages, but we also have a number of awards that are in public policy um, that are in international business. So we're looking for a variety of professionals. We have a whole host of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of review committees that are in the arts. And we're always looking for those who can come in and those may not be connected necessarily with a campus, but are the um, artistic directors. They're the directors themselves, actors, people who could be helpful. And so if you, if you are willing to, to serve as part of the peer review or the national screening committee process, that would be just a, a tremendous benefit and as a way to A, stay involved in the program 
B, stay up to date on the program as Peter was mentioning because things change, but also for you to be able to give back and identify who are the future leaders in your field that might be able to, to, to go forward. So I really wanna make sure you're thinking about that as well. So could we maybe go to the, to the next slide, Peter? I just got a couple more things to, to sort of mention here. Um, one of the things that I know the association is doing and, and is getting into the classrooms because we need to plant the seed as early as possible. Young people need to hear that there are international opportunities. And the more places that we can go and, and get that idea across, the more opportunities then that teachers have and other students have to, to sort of say, oh, well, what would be the international perspective on this? How does that relate to something else that's going on in India or Germany, um, in, um, in Brazil, um, in Taiwan? And so I think young people uh, need to hear that as, as early as possible. And so if we can find different ways to present that to students, especially to, to young people, that's great. I also want you to think about um, your peers. Sometimes your peers, when they find out that you were a Fulbrighter, you know, it's like, oh, um, and, and for those of you who know the reference, you know, to Wayne's world, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy. I couldn't possibly participate in this program. And I think we have to help them get over the fact and the fact that I'm number six in my family of eight, uh, I have lots of siblings that remind me that um, I'm nothing special. I just happen to apply at the right time in the right place. Um, but we need to be able to encourage our peers to think about um, getting involved in the program in a variety of ways and also applying. And then that goes for the students as well. So please keep that in mind. And it may be, especially once we can get back to being in person, it may be more of these formal presentations. It may just be at the bus stop or in the bar where you have an opportunity to bring up these conversations. One of the, the big things that we also wanna emphasize is the focus on the benefits. And this is not the cash payments that we send as stipends. Nobody is going to become the next millionaire by applying to Fulbright. That's not what we're looking at in terms of the financial benefits. What we're, what we're looking at is what are the professional benefits that come how do these networks, and it maybe, really I think about this as, as, as an investment in a, in a year or it's a semester or however long your, your program is, in the context that you're gonna make and the quality of the people that you're gonna come into contact with, not only the individuals, but the organizations as well. And this is the advantage of having the multifaceted nature of Fulbright, being connected with governments, with not with NGOs, with higher ed institutions, with businesses, with an incredible alumni work, uh, network. And I think that is the, the, the major benefit of being involved in the program, especially as we go into celebrating 75 years. So I just wanna keep it tight and make sure that we're, we're ending by, by figuring out different ways that you can be active if you're on a campus, active um, in your office or active in your community. And I think this is one of the things that is underestimated time and time again, and it's the true nature of the program. We ask people to tell us about the ways in which they're going to engage with their host community. And we often ask them to say, how have you done that in your home communities prior to going over on your Fulbright experience? And I really wanna make sure that we're emphasizing what are you bringing back when you come back and find ways to engage with your, with your home communities when you do that. Okay, and that's what really the last message that I wanna end with. I'm gonna turn it over to the other side of the panel. Thank you so much. John Vogel. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is John Vogel. I am a member of the board of directors of the Fulbright Association, uh, a former president of the association. I had my Fulbright a long time ago in Belgium, where I served on the staff of the general council of the then European Economic Union. I currently practice corporate finance law in Washington, D.C. Today, I would like to briefly outline the federal legal framework in the U.S. of those laws, regulations, executive orders and Supreme Court decisions, which have tried so hard and continue to try to break down discriminatory barriers and provide equal opportunities for all members of society. Those laws and regulations have for over 150 years during a number of civil and social upheavals sought to protect society from illegal discrimination, 
and foster inclusion and equality of treatment under our law. First, it is important to understand the meaning of a word that we all use regularly and without thinking about it, diversity. Diversity means the knowing or understanding and respecting a broad variety of human characteristics that make each individual unique, such as race, color, gender, age, national origin, sexual orientation, disability, or genetics. These are, or may be termed the protected characteristics, which are equal employment opportunity laws and many others are designed to protect by ensuring that the protected characteristics may not be considered in making employment and other decisions. Our federal legal and regulatory framework makes it unlawful to discriminate against people based on any of the protected characteristics. Starting with the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which explicitly guaranteed racial equality, the following enactments over the years are notable. <clears throat> Title VII of the 1964 and the 1968 and 1991 Civil Rights Acts recognized the protected characteristics mentioned earlier and made it much easier for aggrieved persons to make claims and bring legal actions for violations. The Equal Pay Act of 1963 mandated there should be no pay discrimination between men and women, except in cases of seniority, merit, incentives, or other clearly non-discriminatory factors. An executive order in 1965 mandated that agencies and departments of the federal government develop and implement plans to eliminate the underrepresentation in the government of women and minorities. The Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965 prohibits the use of immigration and citizenship data in the context of recruiting, hiring, or firing employees. The Age Discrimination Act of 1967 prohibits discrimination for those over 40 based on their age. Executive Order 13152 prohibits the consideration of parental status or having or not having children in the making of employment decisions. The Fair Housing Act of 1968 expanded prior legislation to prohibit discrimination in the sale, financing, and rental of homes on the basis of a protected characteristic. The Vietnam Vets Readjustment Act in 74 prohibits denying employment based on disability, marriage or association or partnership with a person having a protected characteristic or stereotype or assumptions about individuals or groups. The Equal Credit Opportunity Act of 1974 prohibits discrimination in credit transactions on the basis of a protected characteristic or because one may receive public assistance. The Defense of Marriage Act in 1996, followed by the Supreme Court decision in Obergefell in 2015, legalized same-sex marriages. An executive order in 98 prohibits discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. The 2008 amendments to the 1990 ADA American Disabilities Act substantially broadened the act definition of disability and made it far easier to identify what constitutes an impairment in a person. The Genetic Information and Non-Discrimination Act prohibits discrimination based on genetic factors. And the Pregnancy Discrimination Act proscribes employment discrimination based on maternity or pregnancy. An executive order in 2011, in fact, requires all federal departments and agencies to design and implement a, quote, diversity and inclusion plan, quote, which addresses each and all of the protected characteristics and sets forth means for ensuring non-discrimination within the federal government. The federal agency primarily charged with enforcement of the foregoing laws and regulations is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission or EEOC, which is charged with preventing four kinds of discrimination, whether it be direct or indirect. First, discrimination based on any of the protected characteristics. Second, harassment. 
three, bullying, and four, intimidation. And it provides a clear and straightforward process for complaint and legal action in the event of violation. I would like briefly to mention a few Supreme Court decisions that have also gone a long way to combat discrimination through interpretation of these numerous laws and regulations. Starting in 1880, with a decision that prescribed exclusion from a jury on the basis of race, there are numerous anti-race discrimination cases, most notably, perhaps, uh, Brown v. Board of Education in 54 and the Backey decision in 78, which limited the use of racial quotas in education. The court has also decided a number of cases regarding the constitutionality of same-sex marriage, which they recognize as constitutional under the due process clause of the constitution. In all of the foregoing legislation, regulatory and judicial actions, the intent of the federal and state government has been and continues to be to proscribe discrimination based on any of the protected characteristics in an effort to encourage diversity and inclusion and equality of opportunity. The trajectory of our laws since the late 1800s has been to build a formidable legal impetus for non-discriminatory and equality for all members of society. Our challenge and also our opportunity today is not to put new laws and regulations on the books, but rather to fairly and effectively interpret and implement those already on our books. Surrounded by conflict, chaos, and uncertainty, perhaps we should all pause for a few minutes and consider our own opinions and responses in the context of our own cultural narratives. And let us recall the famous Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times. Thank you very much. I am one that has personally benefited from American opportunity. I do not normally face overt hostility as a colored Asian immigrant woman and a former United States government high level official with a PhD. Perhaps it is because throughout my professional career and personal life, I have been blessed with male and female, white and minority mentors and live in an inspiring and supportive family and community. However, I have sometimes wondered why I am the only one who looks like me in the room. And sometimes I have a touch of guilt because there are many who are not included and still experience inequality. I pledge to help us make inclusion a priority in order to provide the opportunity minorities like me were given. For centuries, there have been large groups of disenfranchised Americans who, as the current civil unrest in America has shown, continue to lack equality of opportunity. For our purpose today, we have identified and prioritized some of these diverse groups, African, Asian, Native, Disabled, and older Americans, especially women, and will speak about them. What some findings have shown. For decades, the face of America overseas was designated as pale, male, and Yale. Not many United States ambassadors, even today, are American ethnic minorities and females. Yet we don't question what the inability or unwillingness is to understand or capitalize on inclusion of all Americans to represent American interests. Where does America go from here? Is American leadership encouraging and embracing diversity and inclusion? On September 29th, 2020, the White House sent a directive to United States government agencies 
to eliminate certain diversity training initiatives and threatened to discipline federal officials who violated the order. One initiative they particularly objected to was the critical race theory, which is an academic framework that studies how racism persists institutionally rather than as personal animus. Other topics they directed agencies to avoid in diversity training are white privilege, intersectionality, systemic racism, positionality, racial humility, and often built in unconscious bias. Avoiding these topics means that we lose the opportunity to understand our combined destinies and how our nation's life might move forward in a more perfect union. Another troubling example is the obstacles placed with the United States Census 2020, America's 10-year census count. First, the administration directed that citizenship was required for the resident to be counted. When that was struck down by the courts, the administration limited the time for field enumerators to gather responses. And on October 13th, 2020, the Supreme Court sided with the Trump administration to end the census count on October 16th instead of October 31st. This will, of course, drive down the count of the residents most difficult to reach and enumerate, like the minority and undocumented residents. For each person missed in the count, 1,800 federal dollars will be lost to local jurisdictions to provide services for older Americans, disabled, and many other minorities. Equally significant, representation in the United States Congress depends on the numbers of residents counted in each district. When minorities are undercounted, they lose their potential voice in Congress. When does lack of equality of opportunity begin? Not many of us are aware that Native Americans' educational inequalities are amplified in tribal communities. Thousands of Native American students attend these Bureau of Indian Education schools and rely on federal government funds for their education. In this pandemic, exacerbating the inadequacies of these Native American children, the Bureau of Indian Education delayed the disbursement of the recent special CARES Act funding thus failing to purchase needed equipment for students. Without adequate technology, these Native American students cannot learn online and many siblings have to share a single computer with limited access to broadband, setting their learning back further with no way to catch up. It has taken decades since the 500th anniversary of the 1492 landing of the three ships from Genoa for the awareness to develop of what this landing meant for the millions of Native Americans already here. Thankfully, Washington DC, Maryland, and Virginia have renamed that holiday to Indigenous People's Day. Has diversity and inclusion progressed? Are there positive changes? Yes, in bits and pieces. For decades, the practice in the United States hiring process was to ask, ask an applicant for his or her salary history. With females paid less than males and or their white counterparts, 
the egregious practice of inequality and pay parity followed that woman and or the minority throughout his or her lifetime in the workforce. Now, widely acknowledged changes are being made in America to eliminate that question in applications and interviews. Another example is in the American Armed Forces, where few minority group officers make it to the top since most on the promotion boards are white men. Fortunately, we do have some shining examples that have broken through, like former Secretary of State General Colin Powell. He's a brilliant and charismatic leader who I've had the opportunity to meet and work with when I was deployed to the State Department. Shattering the glass ceiling, the silver lining. Some American women and minorities are benefiting from equality of opportunity. We have come a long way since 1960 when the American National Aeronautics and Space Administration's initial vision was to build a city in space where women could fill the roles of telephone operators, teachers, and nurses. Women pilots with World War II experience were disqualified from applying to the space program based solely on gender until well into the 1970s. In 1983, Sally Ride was the first female astronaut to go into space. The black women calculators we now know were essential to the first space flights, but it took until June 2020 to make public the level of their work with the naming of the agency's headquarters building in Washington, D.C. after Mary W. Jackson, the first black female engineer at NASA. The film Hidden Figures tells that remarkable story. Today, we see further changes. There has been a seismic cultural shift, a shattering of the glass ceiling at NASA's manned space flights. NASA has replaced that term manned space flights to piloted or human space flights. And here are some of the current leadership roles at NASA. Shannon Walker is the first woman astronaut on a moon mission. Kathy Loiders leads the NASA Human Spaceflight Division. Marilyn Hewson is CEO at NASA's contractor, Lockheed Martin's capsule to the moon. And Kathy Warden is the CEO of NASA's supplies contractor for the International Space Station. Even in politics, we see more diversity and inclusion, like Johanna Hayes, Connecticut's first and only black congresswoman. And of course, the first Indian and African-American United States vice presidential nominee, Kamala Harris. So we ourselves ask ourselves, where do we go from here using this 2020 moment of transformation? In sharing this spectrum, and I emphasize we are only discussing American inequality, we see a hopeful transition and availability of equal opportunity in a few sectors. My objective today was to raise awareness and stimulate critical dialogue to energize you, our conference participants, for a paradigm shift from the status quo using this 2020 moment of transformation. We know the Fulbright program is committed to equality of opportunity that benefits all Americans. If we collaborate with our coalition partners, 
to build a dialogue and develop best practices, strategies, we can increase access to all Americans qualified to be recipients of Fulbright Awards. In conclusion, I would like to ask you to please tell us your stories because we are eager to publish profiles of minority Fulbrighters. Thank you so much. My name is Bruce Fowler. I am a member of the Board of Directors of the Fulbright Association and Chair of the Advocacy Task Force. The United States is a nation of immigrants. Discrimination against persons perceived as different, for example, because of race, gender, age, disabilities, etc., is a common human behavior worldwide, but in the U.S. it is illegal, as noted by John Vogel previously. Our history is replete with individuals who have overcome discrimination to make major societal contributions. The U.S. is once again realizing the potential of those left behind by discriminatory practices. Diversity of perspective is a strength, and the Fulbright Association is a potential catalyst for creativity by facilitating the exchange and acceptance of new ideas by all. Some examples of persons who overcame institutionalized discrimination include George Washington Carver, an American scientist of African origin who made major contributions to agricultural practices, Eugenie Clark, a Japanese-American female who overcame gender discrimination and was a Fulbrighter to Egypt, studied biology of shark behaviors, Franklin Delano Roosevelt overcame physical disabilities from polio to provide political leadership in World War II and the New Deal legislation. These and others like them inspire us to push for equal opportunity. Summary, I would argue that we are collectively stronger if we embrace sharing our experiences and resources without discrimination. If we share the finite resources of our planet and collaborate our quality of life and maybe even the chances of our species' survival will increase. Diversity should be viewed as a strength and the Fulbright Association is well placed to facilitate constructive human interactions on a global basis. I'd like to move now then to the Q&A if I can. And I know we had a couple of questions at the beginning and they've now disappeared as questions that got answered with other people, I believe, but let me go to them anyway. The first one really is for Dan Kramer, and it is, uh, how do we become a reviewer for other people getting grants? And I know that's a question that many of you in this audience, and there are over 70 of you here, so glad that you're here. Let's talk about how you can become a reviewer. That's a question for many people. Dan? That's great. I'm happy to take that. Um, what we're looking for is a, a variety of people. Uh, for the US student program, we have over 200 panels this year, and we have three uh, faculty or professionals who serve on those panels. So we're looking for about 650 people this year. And I believe um, there were 100 panels for the scholar program. And so again, we're, we're looking at close to a thousand people every year to be involved in the process. We ask them to usually serve for three years. They don't have to be three consecutive years because we know that professional and personal things come up, but we would love to invest in the training in you to become part of the peer review process um, or the national screening committee process. And therefore we think there's great benefits to continuity um, um, as well as your individual perspectives th that are coming to the table as you do the, the review. What we're looking for oftentimes um, are those, especially in academics, who are academics at the associate level and above, um, because we understand sometimes this may or may not be the most helpful for those who are not tenured. And we wanna make sure that if, if it's going to be beneficial, make sure you check with your chair, your provost. If it is, we would love to have you. Um, and that's in particular for the English teaching assistant panels where we're looking for lots of practitioners. 
that, that goes also then for the arts fields. And so if you could send us a little bit about your contact information, your CV or resume and send it to NSC, so for the National Screening Committee at IIE.org, then we'll make sure that you're put on, uh, on the list and we'll be contacting you as we start to get a better idea of how many uh, panels we'll need for the, for, the, for, the, for, for the coming year. So thanks so much. Dan, am I correct that this is a pro bono activity? This is a pro bono activity. We report on um, the information up to um, the State Department who shares that uh, further up to be able to explain how well the Fulbrighters are contributing back and how we're able to keep costs low to encourage them to allocate the, the funds that they are, have, have been doing for the last 75 years. Thank you. I would like to add something to that if I could. I have twice been a reviewer and I find it a very useful way uh, to meet uh, informally. I don't meet them personally, but, uh, but to, to see how others who want to teach history or American studies or American literature are thinking about their projects. I have learned so much about the current state of my field and about the people who are eager to become representatives of it in scholarly places around the world from reading all these applications. I must say it's real work. If you have 30 applications to read, it doesn't happen overnight and you're asked several questions. I mean, it's a genuine, thorough review. In fact, when people say, oh, well, you know, you just get it, you don't. The vetting that happens, both of your ideas, of your seriousness of purpose, of what you really have to offer and what your background is, is very specifically asked for in these. And it's, it's a remarkable peer reviewed system. And I think that's the key, other key part. It's others who share your world of research and teaching or whatever, who are looking at your work. And so you have a sense that there's real integrity in the program because of it. Thank anyway, you. that's my, that's my yeah. two cents about and, that process. And the one thing that I would also just say because of, of what John was mentioning about equality and access, one of the things that we would also love for you to do is think about people who are at institutions who may not be as involved in the Fulbright program. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that we have as diverse a group at the table doing the selection process as we do in terms of our applicants and ultimately in the cohort of participants. And we know that those of you who are involved then at the selection process and can recommend colleagues who may be at institutions who do not think that they would be part of the Fulbright program, if you could do that for us, that would be a tremendous benefit. Thank you. I, th uh, that's in, I heard someone else speaking in this conference about the HBCUs and then there are the minority serving institutions. And the more we connect across the academic world that we live in, uh, the better the engagement will be. And more and more of that is happening, I hope. Uh, but it's up to each one of us to recognize that and take it seriously. In fact, when I was thinking about the equality of opportunity for the panel that, that uh, has gotten shortened, uh, it really is people like me, look at me, I'm, I'm twice the age of those over 40 and I am very white but I have spent my career focused on inclusion as best I can. When I meet people and see what they can do and who they are, I forward them as best I can. It is, it is something that I have made a basic piece of the way I go about working with people. And it's been enriching for me. And I think there are few people in the world at least who have gotten included that wouldn't have been if I hadn't been around. Um, or that they would have found another way. But it is up to each of us to, to see how the equality of opportunity and access can be realized in this country and in the world. I'm going to go back to a second question now. And that is, uh, there's a person here who wants to be involved in any way with the review or other programs. I think we've got that one answered as well. Those are the only two questions. No, wait a minute, now there's some more, okay. Okay, how can IIE work with the Fulbright Association chapters to further recruitment? 
That's a very good question. Um, I'll take a stab at that. And Dan, if you have any thoughts um, to add. Um, so in the past, it's always been handled somewhat organically, maybe inconsistently, depending on the chapter and, and their level of activity. Um, but we've, we've, we've had chapters reach out directly about events that they're holding or things that they wanted to put together. We've had cases where chapters are very tied in with whatever campus um, community is there. So the FPA or the scholar liaison who host events regularly in conjunction with the Fulbright Association chapter. Um, so we've seen that's kind of a great place to start is to look at the institutions in your, in your area and connecting with them and being a part of the work that they're doing um, to promote the program to students and scholars on their campuses and through that network and hopefully expand it beyond the campus to the community and the other area related to that. And some chapters really have, have done a great job with that and they've, they've organized in a certain way and they're so tied together with their academic community that it's, it's somewhat seamless and it's all part of that larger um, process. In other cases, um, I th can think of an example in South Carolina where uh, a chap the chapter down there wanted to hold a Fulbright Awareness um, Symposium for HBCUs in South Carolina. And they organized this whole event and invited um, me to come down and others to come down to present to this group um, that was in conjunction with uh, universities, was in conjunction with the Fulbright Association chapter there and was, was sort of organized by the chapter uh, in that regard. We've taken that model, and I know that the Fulbright Association has done this as well, and we started to do some pilots this past year that were um, unfortunately had to be shelved a little bit due to the pandemic um, of this concept of a Fulbright Forum. Uh, for IIE, that meant that we travel quite a bit around the country to present on campuses about the program, and we realized we needed to do a better job of not just connecting with the FPA or the scholar liaison and the campus community, but also if there are any chapters in that area um, that might want to engage in some of the events that we're doing. So we selected a few places that we were going to already to present um, that were somewhat underrepresented in Fulbright, um, cities or communities that had enough of an active alumni network, but did not have, um, we did not see as many applications from those areas as we would like, um, and would reach out through the process of the FPA or the scholar liaison and scheduling this, also reaching out to the the chapter to say, we're coming to town, we'd love to work with you to host some sort of an event, whether it's a reception, a panel, um, something that can bring the alumni network together with maybe the college or university network and any prospective applicants who want to sort of get a sense of what Fulbrighters do, who are the Fulbrighters in their community as a way to sort of build that. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get very far with it this year, but we're, we're looking ahead to the future and in, in, in partnering with the Fulbright Association um, national, but also with the individual chapters around the travel that we're doing um, so that we can better connect those pieces. I think it's an area we, we, that we needs a lot of growth um, to connect with this network. As I mentioned, it is it's such a powerful um, network for recruitment and we just need to do a better job of making sure that we are connecting with individual chapters on our travel and that we're looking for ways that we can engage the alumni network, but also um, bring them together with people who are considering applying well, the other, thank you. The other two questions really connect with that one. And one of them is, um, I have just asked to be the Fulbright liaison on my campus. Do you have any suggestions on how to get started and create a vibrant community on my campus? Congratulations um, and thank you. Um, that's that's a great place to start in terms of, especially campuses where um, they may not have been as active in the past, um, there may not be as much of a Fulbright culture where they may not have an FPA or a scholar liaison um, of either becoming that person or helping us identify who that person should be. So uh, thank you very much to that whoever's um, answered that question, asked that question for taking this role on. I think the first step is to reach out to my colleagues if you haven't already, um, Athena Foule and Michelle Bolorci. Um, they sort of oversee the scholar liaison program and can, start you in the process of the, the training that goes along with it, some of the resources that we have for scholar liaisons. We hold several trainings, usually in person, but we're doing a lot of virtual, more virtual trainings this year for new scholar liaisons to sort of bring them up to speed on kind of resources that they, they can access, ways they can approach building this on campus, how they can start to start um, um, to build that, um, that network and that culture. I think the first thing is obviously to, is to seek out any Fulbright presence on your campus. Um, faculty members who've had Fulbright grants, um, or uh, administrators who've had Fulbright grants, visiting and foreign students and scholars who have been on your campus or have come to your campus, any of those places where there may be, a, have been a Fulbright presence of connecting with them and trying 
to kind of organize that because uh, that's a really great place to start is to looking at is looking at what you already have on your campus that's there uh, and then working through what's what seems like the most appropriate step for you whether it's to start to kind of learn about the program and be able to present and hold a workshop either in person or virtually depending on the situation um, for interested Fulbrighters uh, you can invite um, we have uh, alumni ambassadors who are um, like all of you but people who have had really great um, experiences on their Fulbright grant who have then been selected and specially trained to sort of present on on Fulbright from their perspective but also kind of broadly about the importance of the program we can help send those uh, members to campuses to help present on that um, we often we, we're not traveling now, but we will be traveling and we're, we're, we're very happy to also do virtual sessions. Um, so if you wanna host some something to sort of encourage faculty to consider or students to consider applying, we can set up a virtual um, information session with a team member here um, in DC or New York and um, that can kind of walk through sort of the process of applying and the benefits that they go along with. So there's a lot of different directions you can go in with this, um, but definitely reach out to us and we can help kind of more hands-on walk you through kind of the steps you wanna take. Okay, I'm going to thank you for that. As you see, those of you who are listening, there are a myriad ways of being engaged here. And Peter and Dan are both very interested in the administrative part of this and how you can be a leader in your own campus or in your own chapter in order to make things happen. I've got another question now, which is really uh, a key one. And that is um, why should we want to go on international exchange? What is the value of international exchange? Right now, I think we have a bit of a hold back because we can't travel internationally. So why is it that the enrollments are up, uh, the people, more people want to go than ever? What is it about this that is so valuable that we really are trying not only to make it happen uh, as soon as we can get out of the country again, and keep it going as alums when we get back. Who'd like to, who'd like to go at that? I'd, I'd like to just start by saying um, we are sending people over. Uh, we have uh, over 200 students who are already either enrolled in degree programs or are uh, second year ETAs. Mm -hmm. um, and we have more students going over and scholars um, as of January. Um, so the program is um, still in progress. So I just wanna make sure everybody is aware of that. Um, All right. <laughs> number two is I, I think the reason we've, we've had uh, the continued increase um, in the interest in this program, um, as well as uh, partners who want to encourage uh, people to come over, is the value of the international experience in developing incredible skills that are so important in this day and age. Um, we've done a number of studies about employability. Um, we've done things with the NASDAQ. Um, and how the same types of things go for both academics, exploring questions, taking on a new perspective, um, being an entrepreneur and starting a new business, being able to overcome challenges, all of the incredible soft skills involved with grit um, are, are employed in the international experience in a way that's more concentrated than we've seen in, in other areas. And I think people are getting to understand that and how important it is for the hiring process Everybody wants to make sure that people know how to enter into different cultures, how to communicate in different ways, understand how to manage the, under, the, the differences from where people may be coming and where they're going. And if you've had that incredible personal experience in, in, with regards to that, it's very valuable. The other thing is, is that more and more institutions are looking for institutional partners to develop great relationships to advance science because they have access to things that we may not have here. They've got new techniques, et cetera. They've got access to materials. So there's just, there's a number of reasons why um, uh, internet, the international experience today is more important than it's ever been. Okay. I have a question then on a slightly different aspect, and that is to John Vogel. Are you still with us, John? I'm not seeing you right now. Anyway, the question is that, John, we mentioned, you mentioned we should focus on interpreting current laws instead of making new ones. What areas do you think are the most important to do this? Uh, John, you're here. Did you hear the question? 
I see here. Okay, there you are. Did you hear the question? You are muted, John. You're muted. John is here, but he is muted. I've got to get him unmuted. Okay, John, you are, are you there now? Can you speak? Speak, but I they, they, they won't allow me to unmute. Go ahead. Now you are. Okay, the question is, <clears throat> we should, <coughs> excuse me, focus on interpreting current law instead of making new ones. What areas do you think are the most important to do this in? I'm not sure what you mean, what areas. Do you mean what, what but, areas? Well, it says uh, interpreting current laws instead of making new ones. Where are the issues that you think are most important right well, now? Well, I think... I think the I think certainly the uh, the issues of today would be uh, obviously in the area of civil justice, civil obedience, civil disobedience. Uh, I think there has always been, and perhaps unfortunately may always be, a failure of communication uh, to get the laws, to get the regulations, to get the meaning, meaning behind the laws. Sometimes the law is not perfectly drafted. In fact, it's rarely perfectly drafted, but sometimes people don't understand what the true meaning or intent of the law might be, therefore how they should react or respond to it. So um, I think whether it's you know in a domestic uh, in, in a domestic scene or in the employment scene, clearly the employment scene, the economic sectors are obviously impacted tremendously by what's going on, uh, and clearly that that's that that is a primary area that we have to uh, have to focus on, Mary Ellen. Okay, um, okay. Others who might want to get into this answer themselves uh, in interpreting current law instead of making new laws. Where are some key areas that the law and its clarity might impact us as Fulbrighters? It might impact the program. Anyone want to speak to that? There is another question here that might be related, and that is how can IIE, the Fulbright Association, and others work together to better communicate to the US Congress, which by law, uh, is the main funder of the Fulbright program, the Fulbright scholars, teachers, and students, both in the USA and abroad. And how can we better communicate to those who make the decisions and get the money that surrounds this program and supports it and has for 75 years? How can we show how the benefits, both individual and institutional, are real and make a difference in American society? would like to take that on. How can we better- I'll, I'll touch on that. I think um, I think you're probably all aware that uh, the Fulbright Association does have you know, a certain element that, that does advocate on behalf of the program um, to Congress through advocacy days and other, other campaigns and things that are happening. So I would definitely defer to John and Shaz a little bit more about sort of the, um, the ways that the Fulbright Association engages at, as an entity and helps um, alumni better um, share their experience um, on the Hill and kind of some tips and, and tools on how they could sort of, you know, talk to their members of Congress and talk about the importance of the program for them. I would just add on top of that is, and this goes back to what we talked about previously, is um, when you are talking to anyone, anyone other than your close family about the program, um, really think about your audience and what you're telling them um, and why it should be important to them that you have this experience. Um, and so for that, that's a, that's a really key piece when you, when, when, you know, when John and Shaw's organized teams of people going to the Hill um, is you're talking to, to members of Congress who fund this program. Um, they wanna know why, what, what's the return on events, investment? Why, is, why should taxpayer funding go toward this program? Um, what do we get out of it? And so talking about a great experience where you went abroad and you saw this amazing, amazing things, you made all these great friends, um, you just be like, wow, it's just remarkable. I can't wait to come home and tell everyone about it. That's great, but telling a little, talking, thinking through a little bit more about what, how this benefits your career, your community, your institution, you know, the, the multiplier effect, what, what comes from this experience? And we often like to talk about your Fulbright is only like half of the, your actual Fulbright grant is only half of your Fulbright experience. What comes after um, is also important and it's also critical uh, when you're talking to anybody who might be a decision maker or, a funder to talk a little bit about what comes after and why this was an investment in you um, and how you're, how you're paying back that investment um, 
now. And that's that's sort of um, there's many different ways to do that in terms of how you you're meeting with people with with, um, with members of Congress, you're meeting with decision makers, um, uh, you're talking to your peers and institutions um, to try to advocate for Fulbright friendly policies on your campus um, in cases where uh, there may be some reluctance to um, seeing the Fulbright grant as a way to um, as something that is deserving of leave if you're a faculty member, that type of a thing. Um, but that's really important is to really look, get beyond just that personal experience and look at how that has had a major impact on, on others um, beyond yourself. And I would just briefly add uh, just the, the international aspect of it. I mean, we all uh, used to at least, and hopefully will again travel extensively. Uh, we all know people living all over the world. Uh, I think it's important to stay in touch with those people, to share views with those people. They have a lot to offer the Fulbright commissions uh, and associations and groups in all these countries, uh, uh, number uh, you know, well over 100. Uh, they can be a tremendous addition, a tremendous supplement to what we're trying to do and to what they're trying to do in their own countries. So once again, it comes down to communication on a regular basis to the extent possible. And I just want to add something that comes that also connects with other questions that we had about how you can engage your Fulbright Association chapters in certain things. Um, if you're holding events, if you're holding any kind of a, a membership event in your community um, and you're bringing members together, why not reach out to your local congressional office and invite them? Let them know what you're doing. Let them know what your community of Fulbrighters, that there are constituents, they value this, what, what they're getting out of it, um, and invite them and connect with them to really build that relationship with those, those offices as well. So they know and they see firsthand that there are constituents in there. And, and this is not necessarily advocacy related, it's just related to um, building that bridge, educating them about what this program means, um, why it's important to you and how it's still active and it, you carry it with you. Um, and I think that's a really important thing that you can do um, within, your, within your chapters. Well, let me, let me get, uh, I'm supposed to be just the moderator and not to know anything here. Uh, not to, but I, but uh, given that others on our panel weren't here, I'd like to share one story. When I was in China, I was in Northwest China the week that actually the year that Hong Kong returned to the motherland and every day we saw on the TV, uh, the bird of peace flying and there was one more day uh, gone before, before the country came back together as a bigger whole. And my students um, were, is very remote. I was in Lanzhou, Gansu province, way north. If you think of where Fargo, North Dakota is in America is where Lanzhou is in China. So I was right at home. I was at Fargo Moorhead for 18 years, uh, centrally remote. Anyway, I decided because no one would talk except the one person who took all the questions from her friends in the dormitory and then would present them. She was the oldest student in the class. She was the mature one and her English was excellent. And I thought, I've got to get these young people. There was a graduate course in English literature. I've got to get the young people talking. I've got to find out what they know, whether they're doing the work, whether they're engaged at all. And so I ended up asking them each to write a paragraph in response to every assignment with a specific question about it. And then I asked them to begin each class period by reading that aloud as a beginning for the discussion. So I discovered both how much English they could actually speak and how good their English was and how good their understanding of the material was. Then I said, okay, if you're reading along in a poem or a short story and you run across words you don't know, what do you do? You normally just slide by them and think oh, I'll get it at the end. Well, you often don't. I said, if you don't know a word, write it down, look it up, write it in Chinese and in English, add it to your vocabulary grow your vocabulary. Both in Macedonia and China, the two places I've had a Fulbright, the students who did that well developed full dictionaries of new words. The ones who weren't so engaged had a couple here and there and didn't much care about it. But that changed my teaching back in the States because we no longer have only Americans from birth whose English is their natural first language. We are full of classes of mixed background people from different countries all over the world, not just people who are here on a Fulbright, but people who have emigrated to America. We have many, many second language people and we have a lot of first language people whose vocabularies aren't very big. And so 
I started doing that in my classes here, and one of them was in a military base in Turkey, as a matter of fact. I taught for the University of Maryland in Injerlik right after 9-11, and I was back in 2003 and left when the base got neo and the second round of the Iraq war began. That's a whole different aspect of my life, very interesting one. But I did it in that place where I have a lot of students who got GEDs and were trying to take classwork in freshman English. And one young woman who was in her 30s said, I'm gonna try, but I'm really not very bright. I, but I finally got a GED last year and I think maybe I'm gonna try college. And I told her to do this with her vocabulary. I came back to Turkey, as I said, the second time three years later. She said, Dr. Schmieder, I'm a straight A student. I, knew, I discovered I'm not stupid. I just didn't have a very good vocabulary. And once I started doing it, she said, I'm still doing it. And now I listen to some of these people on television and it's clear they don't know what they're reading. They aren't, they aren't saying it right or they aren't pronouncing it right. I realized that I'm really not stupid at all, but I just was limited in my capacity to understand the written word. And now I'm not, I'm still doing it. That was- Mary, sorry, Mary Ellen, I just wanted to give you- Yeah. Sorry, Mary Ellen, I just want to give you the five minute warning. Um, and there's a couple more, there's a couple more good questions in the, in the Q and A, thank uh, you. I'm, I, I am about the, sorry about the brand of uh, Fulbright. Anyway, um, thank you very much. Okay, yeah. I am on it. I gave that example to show a specific way in which the Fulbright changes one's teaching in America. Now back to two more questions, and most of them really have to do with um, how we can be active through Zoom. One chapter in Ohio is trying to engage with members and potential members in the Zoom environment. Another chapter is asking how you can create Zoom meetings across in your research across the world with Fulbrighters you engaged with in another country. How can we work with Zoom more thoroughly both locally and internationally within the Fulbright space? Either Peter or Dan. I would say, so we've had to adapt quite a bit and pivot to fully virtual outreach um, this year. And, and through that process, we grappled with some of the same things I think you all are in terms of how you go virtual and still be engaging and interesting when everybody has a little bit of Zoom fatigue right now um, and everything that's happening with every meeting that's going on. I mean, I, I see Dan like this all the time, just constant. Dan and I, it's like <laughs> constantly on Zoom all the time. So, but what we've been looking at is sort of ways of just being a little bit innovative, taking what we would normally do in an in-person um, capacity and adapting it. And it does allow for things that we weren't able, it does allow for obviously across, reaching across geography. Um, and it does allow for more reach in terms of who you're trying to to who you're trying, the audience you're trying to reach because people are much more able to join an online session than they are to get up, drive, fly, whatever, to go to a presentation that might be happening. Um, it's, it's so we allow, we see that more people are engaging and it allows for a little bit more equity. Um, people can, who can afford to go to a training somewhere or an event somewhere and others maybe can't. And so when you do it online, it does kind of equalize things a little bit to allow for more equity. Um, but some examples that I think could be useful um, that we've adapted is this year we we've, we've piloted uh, what was has been very successful. This idea of and many of you may have already have vis have participated in them. We call them Fulbright in the field impact, um, Fulbright impact in the field, and it's a series of panels that are done over Zoom or go to meeting um, with Fulbright experts and thought leaders in, in in sort of critical topics right now. So we initially did it related to COVID. We realized that that we had Fulbright alumni all over the world who were engaged in 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 essentially the fight against COVID or working with the pan against the pandemic um, in all these different fields and doing really amazing, remarkable things as Fulbrighters do, and that we needed to capture that. So we held a panel to pull together people in those fields to talk through, not to talk about Fulbright and how great Fulbright was, but to say, let's talk about solutions and what we're working on and what's happening, what's, a, what's an issue right now that's happening. Oh, and by the way, I'm a Fulbrighter, my Fulbright experience connected me to what I'm doing now. Um, and we, with that started with, with COVID then in public health. Uh, we, we talked about, um, we, did, we did something on um, disability rights, global um, disability rights. We talked about uh, systemic racism and the, the civil rights struggle and, and Black Lives Matter. Um, and, and we just did one on nursing uh, and nursing sort of 
uh, frontline workers and related to Fulbright and all of these different things were where we, we, fo we focused on a topic that was important to people and interesting and relevant and then pulled together Fulbright Network to talk about this topic. And I think we've seen them very well received. We get create, you know, really large attendance for a lot of them in terms of people interested in this, this topic. And that might be a way to engage your network is, is doing topically relevant talks, finding out who you have in the network um, for your chapter, um, who has maybe something interesting to say or an area of research that um, about something that's happening in the world right now that they can come and talk to the group about that. And sort of these sort of like speaker series types of events uh, are sort of an interesting way of developing. And it's not necessarily, it doesn't replace like a reception or bringing people together for coffee or those types of things, but it does, it does help you build that community around something that might be of interest. Okay, how can, one last quick question. How can we encourage faculty to apply for scholar awards who are afraid they won't measure up even though they're very accomplished, even though it is a competitive thing and they might not get it. How do you walk the line between encouraging and then helping people who discover in the end that they, they don't make it that one? How do we talk about that with faculty? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's challenging, right? I think Fulbright has a certain level of prestige that goes along with it that scares people away. Um, I think what we tend to emphasize is that the program is elite. It's not elitist. Um, it's a U.S. taxpayer-funded program, and by that, we want to ensure that it is as representative of the U.S. as possible. Um, that means a range of different backgrounds, a range of different geographies, different types of institutions, different research areas. Um, and the Scholar program in particular, I mean, both the Student Scholar program, but I'm more familiar with some of the innovations within Scholar, um, was worked really hard to make sure that there were opportunities for postdocs, there were opportunities for community college faculty, um, for a range of different disciplines. We've been really focusing a lot of our outreach on getting to um, rural institutions, small liberal arts, minority serving institutions, really trying to you know, pe make people understand that the important thing is, is the quality of your work in your project, not the institution where you come from, not where you got your degree, all of these pieces that I think people to think of um, within Fulbright of if you're not in a research one university you're not from an Ivy League institution you're not going to be competitive and that's simply not true um, the numbers bear this out um, when you talk to commission directors they talk a lot about how they were they'll look at somebody's project first and, and what's feasible what makes sense if they have the capability to do it and how that would apply in their context and we've heard them over and over talk again about how in their final selection they'll and there's been cases where they've chosen a, um, a community college faculty member um, with not as much experience over an Ivy League faculty member um, because of the, the, the strength of their project and how relevant it is to what their work is. And so that's the type of thing we emphasize is that this is, it's really important that you look at the breadth of your experience, what you wanna do in that country, why, why it's helpful, what the multiplier effect is. Um, and that's huge for community college faculty and small liberal arts schools as well because by and large, you're coming back from your experience and you're teaching students um, and you're interacting and you're sharing that experience with them. Um, not to say that's more important than going over and doing research that can then be part of a publication that you're doing, that's great as well, but there's, there's certain like immediate impact that comes out of um, that side of things and that's why we wanna encourage kind of full range of faculty to apply. Thank you so much, Peter and Dan and John. Um, I think we have made some real difference in helping people who want to be engaged as Fulbright alumni back in America in a country of laws where we need to keep working for equity and access. And you're telling us some ways we can do that as Fulbrighters in our institutions and in our groups. Thank you all so much. And this ends our session and the panels for this conference. I hope Thank you, Mary Ellen. I hope you'll stay around for the wonderful Cohen Dance Lecture, which is the next event.